Okay, good morning and welcome. It's a great pleasure for me to be here today with you and uh, um, I, I would like to uh, thank you for the invitation for this course. This course uh, uh, is called Principles and Technologies for 5G Systems. Uh, my name is Claudio Casetti uh, and I come from the uh, Politecnico di Torino, in Italy. Um, I've personally been working on 5G uh, technologies and systems for the past uh, uh, three, four years, uh, mainly in um, European projects. I will say something about this topic later on, um, where we define and develop many of the systems that will be uh, in 5G um, uh, networks. I'm saying will be because, as you know, 5G is, is not here right now, but is being developed. But we are at the forefront of, of this um, definition and standardization of, of various parts uh, of the 5G network. Um, this is the outline of the course. Uh, as you know, it's structured in five days. Uh, today, I will give you an overview of how we move on from the current uh, uh, state of the art of deployed networks, the so-called fourth generation or 4G. I will just uh, spend some words telling you how we got there. So why 4G? What were 3, 2 and 1 uh, G before, before this? And um, I will uh, give you a, a primer on how we move from 4G to 5G networks. Uh, one thing we have to say right from the start is that uh, 5G networks will be a momentum change from 4G networks, but they will not be a completely different uh, change in terms of um, what kind of technology is deployed. We'll have a faster, more efficient uh, uh, communication, but um, the technology we see in 4G, especially from the point of view of the access network, of the wireless part, is uh, um, in, in large part what will be also in 5G. Faster and more efficient, as I said, but, but still the same, um, the same approach. That's why I'm going to spend some time today to talk about uh, 4G networks and how they will advance toward 5G. So we'll follow the development, but first of all, we've got to establish what um, uh, 4G networks are and what kind of technology they have in the wireless access part. My talk today will mostly cover the access networks of 4G and 5G networks. Uh, the, the core part will be tackled later, much later, actually in the last day by my colleague um, Carla Chiasserini. Uh, in, in between today and uh, the last part, um, we are going to devote a couple of days uh, to go in depth into one of the um, or what which was considered one of the most important use cases and um, uh, it's the connected vehicle. Why am I, am I saying most important use cases? As you shall see, there are some use cases uh, that have been defined by uh, the standardization bodies uh, for everyone who's concerned with standardization to focus on a specific problem. One of these use cases, or specific problems, we might, ca we might call them, is connected cars. And it's so important that now, in the latest uh, stages of standardization, there, there is one specific call for standards and call for projects that focuses on connected vehicles. And that will start next year in Europe. So that's, that's why this is a really hot topic. And, um, I'm going to start addressing it starting from tomorrow, looking it at it from the point of view of uh, the cellular technology. And uh, in the third day, uh, my, my colleague will talk about uh, um, the vehicular use case based on Wi-Fi communication. And uh, um, she will uh, compare the two approaches and show the benefits of using one or the other. Because right now there's a huge debate whether uh, it will, the future of connected cars will be based on 5G 
or will be based on an integration of 5G um, technology and existing vehicular technology. But I'll let my colleague talk about that. On the fourth day, um, we'll, you'll have from Professor Singal um, an overview of broadcasting and multicasting in uh, 5G networks. Okay, so um, I'm going to start, as I said, with a very, um, I'm going to take some steps back. Uh, just to give you a feeling of why we are calling this uh, 5G networks. So my, um, uh, the flow will be, let's just give an overview of what 5G networks are and let's see how we got there and then let's ease into uh, 5G networks by starting from a more in-depth discussion of what 4G networks are like now through LTE and LTE Advanced. So I apologize if I say something that you already know. Uh, if I'm getting too pedantic, just l let me know, but I just want everyone to be on the same page as we go forward. Okay, so what is 5G? Um, as, it, as I write here, 5G is uh, a lot of things, and it's easier to say what will not be 5G in, in the future, in the, the future of, of networking. Um, 5G definitely introduces uh, new features that are not there in 4G networks. 4G networks are mainly focused on um, mobile broadband and um, phone calls, of course, uh, data on our smartphones or our tablets, but that's just about it. It's just giving a lot of bandwidth that we didn't have before on our mobile devices. 5G networks will of course do that at a uh, even uh, higher bit rate, but they will also introduce um, a larger set of use cases, uh, more connectivity, more densification of, of, of um, uh, user cells, and they will have to deal with a higher number of devices and so on. This will bring up um, some issues that 4G networks are not capable of dealing with right now today. 5G is being uh, um, has, has started to see its development uh, in the last three, four years, and uh, it is foreseen that it will the standardization will go on until 2020. Although as I will show you in a timeline briefly uh, coming up, we expect to have the first uh, deployment, first showcasing of 5G devices in a couple of months at the um, Winter Olympics in uh, South Korea. Okay, as I said, what is 5G? Uh, let's take a step back and see how we got there and what are the previous generations. I'm, I'm sure many of you already know uh, what they are. Um, the first generation actually dates back to the 80s uh, of the previous century. It was mainly an analogic type of communication. It was just voice. Um, there were a couple of standards that were used, uh, there were AMPs, there were TACS. They were not very efficient, uh, at least from the point of view of, of, the, uh, of the bandwidth that they were using. They were using a lot of bandwidth. They were easily prone to um, heaves dropping. They didn't have secure communication. The quality of the calls uh, was not good at all. But that's to be expected from a fully analogic um, technology. And that's why in the 90s, we had the great breakthrough of mobile phones with the second generation. The second generation uh, was the, the truly the, the very um, widespread worldwide uh, mobile communication with the GSM in Europe, with um, uh, GPRS that started moving some small amount of data uh, at a rate that today is, would be barely enough uh, to read a few uh, characters on, on, on the screen. Uh, but it was a start. It was a start and it was the first fully digital uh, mobile technology that introduced also robust uh, 
um, encryption and robust authentication. Uh, so mm, it was also the first one that really uh, started spreading among the public, uh, where people uh, were having their first phones. were not smartphones back, I back then. We were just uh, phones that could ba barely make phone calls and send SMSs. Mm -hmm. Those were the only um, use cases that, that they could support. Um, finally, uh, 10 years ago, more or less, actually 15 years ago, we had the third generation, or in terms of technology, this was called UMTS, uh, Universal Mobile Telecommunication System. UMTS brought data into the picture. Even though you already had data with GPRS and Edge in the second generation, third generation was the first one to have kind of not really broadband, but uh, starting from 2 megabit per second uh, with a basic UMTS, going up until uh, uh, tens of megabit per seconds with um, HPSA. Um, that was one of the uh, novelties brought about by 3G. They also touted something called video calls. I don't know how many of you ever did a video call on your on your phone before with, with 3G, but uh, I, I personally never used that feature, although that was touted as one of the, the trump cards of 3G systems. No one ever used it because uh, when, you, when you think about it, it's quite awkward to have video calls instead of phone calls, uh, and uh, this kind of usage never really really took off. But uh, the interesting thing we had from, from 3G was that uh, we started seeing something that was not just phone calls, but we started seeing an integration of services. Phone calls integrated with video calls, integrated with data. And this integration was a novelty because uh, right before we just had one single uh, uh, service that was being used. 3G was also the first uh, um, technology that was a really um, a worldwide standard. 2G had the problem of uh, a fragmentation of standards. Europe had their own standard, the US had their own standard, Asian countries had their own standards. They were also using different uh, um, parts of the spectrum. So if you bought a, a 2G phone in Europe, when you traveled to the US, you could not make a single phone call. Um, for, the, for one thing, because your phone wasn't even able to operate at the same frequency where they were operating in the US. 3G was the first generation that really uh, broke the barrier. So you could travel all over the world and kind of be sure that you could communicate, of course, you'd have all the roaming charges, but you communicate wherever you could go. And 4G was the same. Uh, the great novelty of 4G is that it's the first all IP technology. You know, IP networks uh, are the, the, the uh, standard for internet communication. And uh, uh, what you had in 3G was um, IP networks were just confined to one part of the core network. From there on, there were just some tunneling to a different protocol stack, and this made things awfully complicated. In 4G, you have an all IP approach. All IP means that your IP stream is uh, terminated at your user terminal, at the phone. So one end one endpoint of the IP communication is your phone. Is your phone? The other endpoint is the server. And 4G was the first one to do this. Um, uh, it started introducing several uh, of the um, network commodities we have today. So we uh, we had uh, cloud computing that was um, one of the great innovations, not just for fixed networks, but also for mobile phones. Um, we, you, you, we, we, we started seeing really fast uh, um, data rates, uh, hundreds of megabit per second. Um, of course, there were still video calls, uh, uh, but, but now the, 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 uh, the service 
uh, platforms were much more diverse. This went to under the, the um, acronym of LTE. LTE is a funny acronym because it means long-term evolution, as if we were looking at something that will happen in, in, the, in the past. Well, it was a long-term evolution when it started being developed, that was almost 10 years ago, um, but now we are already past this long-term evolution and we are into the realms of, of 5G. So this is the, um, in this picture here, you see the timeline, one of the many timelines I'm, I'm going to show you, um, a timeline that details the evolution of uh, 5G in terms of standardization. So let, let me say something about how these standards work. Uh, 5G, like 4G and 3G before it, uh, relies heavily on standards. Why? Because, of course, all um, technology manufacturers need some blueprints that they can all agree upon before they start building their products. Um, in cellular communications, uh, the standardization goes through a body called 3GPP. Um, 3GPP, uh, and don't be fooled by the 3G. 3G uh, was the name given at the time when it started taking over the global harmonization of standards for third generation. But it kept the same acronym even for fourth and fifth generation. So even though sometimes you may come across something called 5GPP or 4GPP, they're actually still 3GPP. Um, these standards are progressing through so-called releases. So a release is a closed set of documents that detail what is the state of the art of the technology so far. So a release progress starts as a starting point in time and an ending point in time. Between this time interval, you have a, a document set that details everything that needs to be uh, agreed upon in terms of access networks and core networks and the services. They are all freely available. So if you have uh, a free week, you could browse through all the documentation. It's huge. It's huge and um, it's sometimes daunting looking through all of it because uh, it's quite well structured, but um, you never know where to find things. So if you're looking for a specific detail on um, how you design um, the MIMO services for the antenna in, in, in 4G or in 5G, good luck. Because you have to, likely you have to wade through thousands of pages before you find a small paragraph where they say what you're looking for. But still, it's, it's there, and it's going to be huge because it's very detailed. Um, this timeline shows you the progress of these releases. As you see here, uh, if you look at the, at the time where we are right now, I don't know if I can use, okay, I can use a pointer, probably you can see it. We are, we are here, and we have just seen uh, the so-called freezing of release 14. Uh, a release, as I said, a release has an opening time and a closing time. The closing time is actually a bit um, strange as a term because you don't really close it. But what you do is you freeze it. Freeze it means you can no longer add any additional features to that release. Or even though you may still complete, have to complete, have to Mm, uh, fine-tune some of the details. When you have fine-tuned all the details, then you close the release. So the release may be either uh, open and running, or frozen, or closed. Right now, um, only 3G standards, only releases that are relating to 3G standards, that is until, until release 7, are closed. From release 8 onwards, they are still in a frozen state. That means so you cannot add any features, but you, if you want, you can fine tune something. That is, you can find some documents, there is some editing going on. Um, 
and and uh, so that means that basically we have pretty much consolidated everything about the fourth generation because up until release 14 everything is frozen 5g really starts from release 15 so the first uh, release that is fully 5g is release 15 in the standard this is open right now so mm, they are if you see documents there uh, likely they are not complete there is uh, missing parts uh, there are there are ongoing discussions um, there are also some uh, if you see them at the bottom there are also these WRC 12 WRC 15 WRC 18 19 it's actually 19 uh, this is the World Radio Conference it is the most important uh, um, conference of all operators and manufacturers and researchers in terms of spectrum allocation so m roughly every three four years uh, there is this world radio conference that has to consolidate which parts of the spectrum will be allocated to uh, 4g in the case of uh, wrc 12 uh, wrc 15 already started um, an outlook of what will be the spectrum likely used by 5G and uh, WRC 19 it would, will be in the early it will be in a uh, Sharm el Sheikh in Egypt in uh, I guess January or February uh, 2019 they will say the final word on what the spectrum for 5G will be so some of the things that I say today and will be said in the coming days may still change because 5G is, is being developed as we speak. Uh, another interesting, uh, um, more, more focused on what's going on right now uh, in 3GPP, uh, as you see here, we have release 15. Release 15 is a so-called 5G phase one there are going to be three phases phase one usually phase one is when is where you look at uh, um, just the broad picture of the technology in a phase in the standardization there are three stages they are detailed here these three stages the stage one is where you look at user requirements so in stage one documents you see okay a user will need uh, uh, high broadband will need high mobility uh, will need um, there will be a, the need to address many uh, thousands or millions of devices uh, you will need uh, to address remote control for automation all the user needs will de are detailed in stage one stage two of the release usually deals with um, the functional description of how the whole architecture works so you start putting building blocks in there and say okay for the, all the use cases detailed in stage one these are what you need and finally stage three is the implementation where you start putting together some prototypes and, and uh, uh, proof of concepts and when you freeze uh, the standardization and at the beginning of 2018 we'll start seeing some freezing already of at least the radio part and then you have the ASN, ASN as you may, may know ASN is a formal language to describe protocols so after you have completed stage 3 you go through this formalization of the protocols through a, an ASN description of every single protocol the other um, thing I wanted to uh, point out just in terms of standardization you see that there are numbers right here uh, these are the uh, TSG TSG stands for uh, technical specification group it's the group of people who write the standards um, the technical specification groups there are many groups each devoted to a specific aspect so there's the radio um, access network specification group there is the core network specification group there is a services specification group and so on they meet every three months 
the, by the way, the next meeting, mm, num number, number 79, um, they are numbered in increasing, so they go back quite a lot, as you can see. Um, the next one will be in Chennai, in, in India, in, uh, in, in coming March. And there we will see uh, the, the freezing of parts of the description of the radio for 5G. Um, another, another picture of a roadmap. Um, this picture, I don't know if you can see it, it's written, it's, it's a, bit, a bit small, small characters here. But what I wanted to point out is beside the um, 3GPP standardization, there are also other types of actions. And these are some of the actions that we are involved in as well that are European projects. So in 2014, the European Union put together a group called uh, um, the 5G PPP. PPP stands for Private and Public um, Partnership. It put together universities, industries, operators, manufacturers to, brain to brainstorm and to um, work on different aspects of 5G through research projects. So what we do in these projects is we work together with the standardization and we do research on it. So we try to support the standardization with our research, say, okay, these things are going to work. Um, we need to have a better understanding of how the uh, core network operates under these conditions. So we run simulations or we even have proof of concepts in, this, in these. And they go through three um, stages. The first stage is coming to a close at the end of this year. The first phase, actually, of, of these five GPP projects is coming to a close uh, this week, basically. The second phase has started already, so there are already projects running, and we are involved in one of them. Um, and then there will be a third phase starting next year. That will be all about implementation. So mm, large-scale trials uh, all over Europe, sometimes also involving um, non-European countries. We have partnerships with um, uh, Taiwanese um, and Chinese companies that want to see how the 5G will look like, and Korean as well. Uh, and so we partner with them in our projects. As I mentioned before, there will be a showcase of 5G technology, but it's a showcase, so it's just for the media. Uh, some of the media will be issued with prototype uh, tablets uh, that will, uh, um, will, will allow them to follow the Winter Olympics in, in a Pyeongchang, I hope I pronounced it correctly, in Pyeongchang in Co South Korea. And um, um, there will be a showcasing for a few selected uh, members of the media uh, who will have the opportunity to see how 5G works. Uh, uh, so they will have high bandwidth and then 4K video delivered to their, their devices. We expect that the first commercial deployment will be in 2020. And um, uh, some of the, of the um, landmark events will be the European, uh, the Euro 2020 uh, football um, European Cup. You know that in Europe we are more about football than cricket, but uh, uh, that, that's our, uh, our f uh, top sport. So uh, we will have also a showcase of 5G technology, not a showcase, uh, the first uh, uh, deployment of 5G technologies at the um, 2020 Olympics in Tokyo. And we expect a full commercial deployment beyond 2020. Okay, now uh, I've said a lot about what uh, we are doing to develop 5G, but I haven't said much about what 5G will be. So the objectives of 5G, as I said, we uh, in 5G are trying to go beyond what 4G offers. 4G offers connectivity to um, phones, tablets, but we expect that in 5G there will be plenty of devices, not just phones 
and uh, tablets. There will be drones. There will be uh, remote operated uh, robot arms. Um, there will be cameras. There will be cars. There will be um, trucks. Uh, logistics will all be based on small devices that will be attached to every single uh, parcel or good that we are moving around. One of the key aspects of 5G is going to be a proliferation of the connected objects. There will be everything will be connected. We expect uh, um, an increase at a three order of magnitude increase in the number of connected objects because not just phones we expect uh, um, all small things, the, the so-called Internet of Things is also one of the buzzwords that's been going on, uh, if you are familiar with it, will be supported by, by 5G. So domotics, uh, but there are uh, very uh, sectors in, in, uh, in the industry that will benefit from this. E-health, for example, so the ability to monitor outpatients by mm, giving them a device that will track their blood pressure, their heartbeat, uh, uh, their insulin levels, whatever. And, and when you start giving out all this stuff, then you need something to collect this data, to process this data. Um, some connected cars, one other of the, uh, of the use cases. Industrial manufacturing, uh, many industries are looking into 5G to um, make manufacturing uh, e more easily controlled remotely. So what they're doing is they are implementing the same manufacturing process that you have in one factory and they're moving it exactly like that in another factory and they remote control every process uh, by having every piece of equipment uh, connected to something. And that, of course, requires not just uh, high bandwidth, but also very low latency. Uh, latency here is one of the, the key words. Uh, I will say something about that later, but uh, one of the, the, the key things here is being able to have a quick response to everything you send in the network. So having um, un around one millisecond time of latency from the time you issue a uh, a command to the time the command is being actuated by a robot arm, for example. And, and there will be more pervasive human-centric applications, so not just uh, Internet of Things, but also things for, for us. Um, virtual reality, uh, mm, this will allow us... We had a, um, a showcase at Polytechnic of Turin uh, a couple of weeks ago, done by our one of our operators, Tim, and um, by Ericsson as a manufacturer, that showed us um, in a very confined environment uh, um, the capability of one of these um, uh, systems, the 5G systems, by allowing us to see, uh, to have a virtual reality tour of um, a castle that we had in another uh, part of the city. So this connection, so people would don uh, a helmet, a visor, and it, they were trans being transported in this other environment. There was this castle, and they were able to move around. And it was funny because you, 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 saw, you saw people just uh, uh, wearing a visor and interacting and talking uh, to people who were there at the, at the castle, and they felt like they were there too. So they were really immersed in a virtual reality environment. And this requires very high bandwidth, of course, and very low latency. So 5G will support human-centric applications and machine-to-machine -machine type applications. Uh, and one of the, the things I want to underline here, so I have one slide specifically for this, is that um, unlike previous generations of, of networks where you uh, had a great focus on the radio part, um, on being able to empower the access network, the, the part that allows you to connect to uh, the, the antenna. 5G is also being so also about f the access network, of course. So uh, having um, high modulations and, and, and having MIMO that allows you to uh, reach high data rates, but it's 
also about uh, doing something with the huge amount of data that you're collecting from the access network. Because the moment you have everything connected to the network and you uh, have uh, sensors and you have actuators and you have uh, cars and people and at the same time they are sending and receiving huge amounts of data. What do you do with this data? How do you move this data around? How do you make sure that you are not dumping uh, data on the network uh, and congesting the network? This will need a tight integration of the radio part and the, uh, the infrastructure. So 5G networks will be about a sophisticated integration of massive, and when I say massive, I mean uh, order of terabytes that need to be handled uh, by all parts of the network. So massive computing and storage infrastructure that will have to go hand-to-hand -hand with, with 5G, with the radio part. I will not talk much about uh, this uh, slide here other than tell you where we are going to focus today. Today we are going to focus here. This is the infrastructure layer but as you see the 5G ecosystem will be much more than this. The infrastructure layer is what you see. Uh, your, your phone, your tablets, your, your devices, the antennas and um, the optical fibers carrying the signal from the antennas to the data centers but from there on there are many more layers that you won't be able to see at first but but are there and will be responsible for handling this massive amount of information so there will be a layer called the network function layer where there were um, there will be a huge uh, use of virtualization the reason is that we will need in 5G to be able to reconfigure the network very quickly to deal with sudden surges of data coming from one area and then going to another area. Imagine if we have connected cars. If we have connected cars, we have moving, we have very fast moving uh, terminals uh, that need uh, a very um, close control. So uh, think about the autonomous driving case. You have a, a car that drives by itself but needs to be aware of its surrounding, needs to be aware of what other cars are coming. And you can do this partly with uh, onboard sensors and radars, but most will be done by talking to other cars, by talking to servers. Servers that, for example, tell one car, look, uh, statistically I know that this stretch of road has seen several accidents in the past and these accidents have been of this type um, I don't know someone who has uh, jumped the line or uh, a pedestrian crossing unexpectedly so be aware for these type of accidents and if you want to have this kind of, uh, of conversation between a car and a server then you need the server not far away you need the server very close to the car because this kind of interaction and conversation needs to happen in milliseconds. So what we're doing, what we'll be doing in 5G networks will not have a physical server remotely deployed hundreds of kilometers away. We will have a virtual function that does this kind of control following the car. Following the car by being deployed as closely as possible on commodity hardware. So we'll have like small uh, computers that will be deployed uh, uh, near um, near uh, re remote radio heads, the, uh, the antennas where um, we have the radio communication between uh, the terminal and, and the network. And uh, uh, imagine this virtual function following the vehicle from one computer to the other as the vehicle moves so that this conversation may happen very very rapidly and quickly and promptly and this is all done by the so-called network function layer then we will have another layer called the orchestrator the orchestrator is um, what will as the name goes orchestrator like directing an orchestra 
the orchestra, the players in this case are the network function. And the orchestrator will tell this network function, okay, you move from here to there. We have an accident there, so move this network function there to control. Or um, imagine we are having remote surgery. Remote surgery uh, from one hospital where we have the surgeon in another hospital in the countryside where you need to have uh, surgery and you can't move the patient. So you may have a 5G connection that allows a surgeon in one hospital to operate to control a robot arm and uh, perform the surgery. And if you do that, all of a sudden you need to have hundreds of um, megabytes and gigabytes of data that need to go from that university, from that uh, hospital, sorry, to another hospital in the countryside. And, and you may not have the infrastructure ready so what you're doing here, you are preparing your infrastructure before by putting commodity hardware, and then you power it up with virtual functions when you need them, whenever the, the need comes. So you don't need to have special hardware there being ready at all times. And the orchestrator will maneuver these, uh, will move and uh, activate and deploy these virtual functions all the time. And, and um, this will be inside uh, one operator. Uh, what 5G also envisions is a collaboration between operators, uh, the so-called multi-tenancy. So operators may have a specialty for some virtual functions and they may uh, lend uh, some of their virtual functions to other operators if they need a specific use. This is why we have these red arrows between operators' domains. On top of the operators, we have the so-called verticals. A vertical, a vertical is a very commonly used keyword in 5G networks. A vertical is a user. In very simple senses, it's a user, but a big user. A vertical is like um, a manufacturer or an industrial uh, or a company. Or, well, w one example is in a, uh, the e health. So advanced uh, health services that I was uh, explaining before. A vertical would be a hospital who needs to have access to um, all the monitoring done to the, to the outpatients that are being followed by this hospital. So um, vertical, a uh, health vertical will have specific needs that is connections to many small devices that are constantly sending uh, small streams of data. There will be another vertical, for example, a car manufacturer who wants to equip its cars with collision avoidance uh, functionalities. This vertical will have the need of large amounts of data being uh, moved uh, with very low latency. So verticals are end users or large end users who have specific needs. That is why 5G will be vertical oriented. They will prepare an environment and give the verticals the ability to select uh, how all these uh, uh, use cases and their um, requirements will be served by the network. The, f the last day my colleague will talk about the upper part. So my colleague will talk about basically these layers. Uh, today we are just focusing on the infrastructure layer. Okay, this is what, I'm going to skip this slide because I, I've said this. Uh, <coughs> <coughs> sorry. The first phase of 5G, as we have seen before in the timeline, was about uh, outlining the use cases. So in the, in the first phase of the 5G standardization, three use cases were being targeted. So the standards bodies got together and said, okay, what are we going to do with uh, these 5G networks? Are we going to mm, have networks that are fully automated? Are we going to have networks uh, that go very fast? And these are the three use cases that they have outlined. They are 
enhanced mobile broadband. They are machine-to-machine uh, -machine type communication and they are ultra-reliable, low-latency communication. These are three broad categories of use cases. It means 5G networks will cater for, will address these use cases. What is an enhanced mobile broadband? Enhanced mobile broadband means uh, um, bit rates in the neighborhood of hundreds and possibly thousands of megabytes. 5G will have on the radio axis will have gigabytes capabilities. If you compare to what we have now, uh, 4G is up to 100 more or less megabit per second, hundreds of megabit per second. 4G advance 400, 500 megabit per second in the best case. Uh, 5G will be gigabytes, two, three gigabytes. And we have seen in the showcase that I, I referred to earlier, that we had from Ericsson uh, a couple of weeks ago, we have seen two gigabytes uh, connections already done between uh, um, an antenna system and uh, a user terminal. Uh, they were not really very appealing to see because uh, this antenna system was, well, it was quite big also because it had MIMO, uh, very massive MIMO, I'll say something about that later, and the user terminal was as big as a fridge, not really a mobile phone, but still, still a prototype of course. Machine-to-machine um, ma -machine type communication is um, all the transport and logistics, uh, smart agriculture, so for example uh, tractors uh, uh, that are coordinating between themselves uh, to um, spray pesticides or to um, harvest crops in, in large areas or sensors that are collecting the status of these crops, whether uh, uh, fruits are ripe, uh, whether the crops are being attacked by pests and so on. And then there are the ultra-reliable low latency communication like um, V-color communication. <coughs> they need to be ultra-reliable because you need, if you want to trust your vehicle to do what you will no longer be doing, then you need the vehicle to be always connected and the communication to be always running. Uh, you will need uh, um, low latency because of the need to control very tightly what the vehicle is doing. Other examples are drone delivery. We have seen Amazon, if you've seen some, uh, there are some videos on YouTube of Amazon uh, testing drone delivery of their own uh, products and their own, uh, their own goods. Uh, and, and drones will need to be remotely controlled and, and right now what we're doing is uh, we can do it using specialized uh, uh, radios, but 5G will give the opportunity to have a very um, tight control of drones, even from far away. We are doing all this uh, with some technologies. So here I am just listing what technologies will be introduced by 5G networks, and then we'll see them more in detail. Uh, 5G will uh, introduce advanced waveforms, so not just pure OFDM as we have seen in, uh, as we see in 4G systems. Advanced MIMO, specifically massive MIMO, uh, again I will say something about this later, and uh, uh, different use of spectrum. The spectrum of, five of 4G <coughs> has been limited to three bands. 5G looks at these three bands and more. And there will be um, higher frequencies, so-called millimeter wave. Millimeter because we're talking about the wavelengths that correspond to frequencies around uh, uh, more higher than 20 um, gigahertz up to 80 gigahertz. They have different propagations uh, uh, properties of course but um, they will be useful because they have large chunks of, of, of bandwidth available at these frequencies. 
The other technologies are software defined networking, uh, network function virtualization, and network function uh, orchestration. What I, I was referring to earlier as the possibility of moving around the functions on the network to serve whatever needs we have rising um, in the specific areas. So no longer dedicated hardware being deployed in one place, but commodity hardware deployed everywhere with specialized function that, that follow the user wherever they, they go, wherever they need to be. Okay, but how do we get there? How do we get to um, all these uh, a uh, huge plethora of things that we are looking at in 5G networks. Let's start from 4G. Let's consolidate what we have in 4G, also because um, I've mentioned this before, you will see a lot of different ways of doing things on the core network, but the radio part, the access network, will not be much different in terms of architecture for what we have today. So the radio part of 5G network, the architecture of the radio part <coughs> will be mostly 4G. Some things will change, wavelengths, uh, modulations, but the architecture, the philosophy underneath, underneath is the same. Okay, uh, stand LTE standardization is uh, has been going on since uh, uh, 10 years already and uh, as you already heard it's standardized by 3GPP and it goes through several coexisting releases as I mentioned before um, five sorry 4G starts from release 8 all the previous releases four, five, six, seven, are uh, UMTS, so 3G. Release 8 is the first one, and it, was it, it began in 2007, so 10 years ago, and it has been going on ever since. Um, all of these uh, releases, including the last one, release 14, are now closed. So, are sorry, are now frozen. All the previous ones are closed, this one are frozen. So what we are talking about in 4G is how the technology really works. Oh, sorry, one more thing I want to point out. Um, release 8 and Release 9 are uh, known as basic LTE. Release 10 to Release 14 are known as LTE Advanced. Okay, um, in the first release we had uh, just broadly the speed that, uh, five, that 4G uh, achieve, promised to achieve was hundreds of megabit per second in uh, downlink and uh, around uh, uh, 50 megabit per second in uplink. We had a great change in terms of technology from 3G systems. In 3G systems, uh, the basic technology was CDMA, Code Division Multiple Access. In 4G, the um, technology used for radio communication became OFDM. OFDM uh, was seen as a better alternative for uh, CDMA for the very reason that it's much cheaper, it's more flexible. The problem with CDMA was that it's extremely complicated, so um, the chips were very expensive and you could not expect to go much higher in terms of speed and bit rate and data rate with those chips. So you needed to find something that worked more efficiently and was cheaper to use. And it also allows operators a much fine grain, um, much more fine grain control over, over um, how much bandwidth they give the user. That's why OFDM was introduced. It uses uh, MIMO. High order MIMO, uh, what we are seeing in, in LTE is a 2x2 two two and 4x4 four four at most, but it's usually 2x2. Two two. And the, the frequency bands that are used 
are uh, up to 200 megahertz channel with scalable frequency channels ranging from 1.4 to 20 megahertz in different chunks. The, the great uh, difference with respect to four, uh, th 3G beside uh, the radio technology is also that it is an all IP core network. So everything is terminated uh, at the, the terminal. The frequency bands used are 800 megahertz, 1,800 megahertz, and 2,600 megahertz. <coughs> the difference between these uh, uh, frequency bands are that propagation is different at, at these frequencies. Uh, so if, if you just look, think about uh, the, the, the freeze uh, um, equation, you know that uh, the, the path loss that these frequencies uh, uh, experience is dependent on the square of the frequency. Uh, for, for this reason, we in 4G are capable of having different uh, frequencies, but they will have different coverage. So uh, higher frequencies will be used for smaller cells, while uh, lower frequencies are used for larger cells to provide umbrella coverage. For example, that is filling the holes of several small cells, or uh, uh, to provide coverage in large rural areas where we don't have the opportunity to deploy many towers. Um, in general, and I'm probably saying something very obvious here, the smaller the cells, the higher the capacity of the system. Because by having small cells, you are capable of addressing uh, the needs of uh, many people in a tightly packed area. So if you are deploying uh, um, cells for uh, places where you have gathered a large gathering of people, uh, like stadiums uh, or, or squares, then you want to have small cells because they will offer a very confined area where only uh, a small number of people are, 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 are uh, roaming around, are moving around, and all of them will be able to have access, will have resources, radio resources given to them. Whereas if you cover one stadium with a very large uh, cell, like an 800 megahertz cell, uh, then you very quickly run out of resources because the, the, uh, the frequencies there won't be able to serve everyone who is in that area. Um, yeah, well, these are the key performance indicators of LTE. I just want to point out, besides something that I've already mentioned, that the uh, LTE cater for high mobility as well. Uh, so it, although it's optimized for slow mobility and people walking around, it also works with high performance up to 120 kilometers. So you're able to receive high data also when you are on a train or uh, when you're driving around, hopefully not while you're driving, but as you are um, riding a car as a passenger. And it provides supports also for uh, faster moving um, cars or, or pl even planes. Uh, even though you're supposed to turn off your, your uh, um, mobile devices when you're on a plane, if you happen to forget about it, uh, you may find out that as you are landing, your phone is already connected to the 4G network. Uh, that's that's not unusual, even though when a plane lands, as, as you know, um, you are traveling at speeds higher than 100 kilometers per hour. So uh, 3G wasn't, wasn't able to do this. 4G can do this also for planes. Uh, the major features of LTE here are, I want to point out a couple of things, flat architecture. Flat architecture means that um, unlike second and third generation where the architecture of the network was very hierarchical and uh, that brought about complications because you need to have a piece of higher hierarchy controlling everything underneath. In the 4G flat architecture, you have elements of the architecture talking to each other. You have 
towers talking to each other. In 3G and 2G, every tower need to step back one element of, of hierarchy to be able to talk to each other. So they could not, for example, even in terms of uh, handover, when one device moves from one coverage to another in 2G and 3G, you need a complicated procedure in the core network to handle the handover. In 4G, thanks to this flat architecture approach, um, handover happens much more quickly because you basically hand over from one tower to another with minimal um, with minimal control uh, they control uh, traffic being exchanged. Scalable bandwidth refers to the availability of different chunks of um, channels. Uh, then you of course have MIMO and you have either order modulations up to uh, 64 QAM and, and then you use OFDM. Okay, this is the LT network architecture. This is very important because what you see here, although uh, the title of the slide is LTE network architecture, this is the architecture of 5G as well. So 5G will have the same architecture you see here. So it's worth to spend some time looking at this slide and understanding what, what we are looking at here. So broadly, you see uh, one large block called EPC. EPC stands for Evolved Packet Core. Evolved because it's an evolution with respect to 3G that had many more <coughs> blocks inside. And uh, had this hierarchical uh, um, structure. The EPC is much simpler, more streamlined, has got fewer entities inside. And the EPC, this uh, uh, gray block here, interfaces with well other EPCs of other operators through the internet, but mostly it interfaces with the E. UTRAN. What is UTRAN? UTRAN is a terminology that was introduced in the 3G networks. It stands for UMTS Terrestrial Radio Access Network. Uh, then it became Universal Terrestrial uh, Radio Access Network. But the point is UTRAN that is still shown here is the 3G access network. E UTRAN is the 4G and the 5G as well, the radio access network. There are clouds. These clouds here represent the access network and the evolved packet core is connected to both 4G radio access network as well as 3G radio access networks as well as 2G. GRAN stands for GSM Edge Radio Access Network. So, sorry. That means uh, these are still being operational. I, I think it's not surprising to know that even though 2G is uh, now a 25 years old technology, you still have a 2G chip in your mobile phone, even the newest ones, because your mobile phones still need to connect to 2G uh, towers wherever they are available, and they are. Most of the phone calls you do today still go through a 2G network. Why? Because the, the technology is there, uh, the infrastructure is there, the operators welcome the chance to use those frequencies and those um, radio capabilities for voice because right now they value data much more. So they don't want the voice to take part of the frequencies of the data. So they leave the 2G and 3G infrastructure to handle the, the voice calls and uh, they have the 4G infrastructure and 5G infrastructure mostly for data. That's why you still see GRAN and UTRAN here. Um, inside the UTRAN, the main component is the E node B. The E node B is uh, um, the antenna and uh, the intelligence with the antenna. I said that uh, 4G and 5G are of the same 
new trend. That's partly true, as a matter of fact, because um, while in 4G we see the E node B, that is uh, uh, where all the processing happens, once you have received the signal from the antenna, the signal is processed in baseband and it's converted into a data bits that are being sent to the core network. And this happens in one place. So one place has the antenna and has the baseband processing. In 5G, we will see a different approach. In 5G, we will see antennas or uh, as they are called remote radio heads so just the receiving part that is being deployed uh, everywhere so we'll have just like we are now used to seeing uh, uh, Wi-Fi access points with one over there there will be access points or, or small devices that are just the receiving part and then they will have an Ethernet connection or, or a fiber connection to the E node B one E node B will control multiple remote radio heads and this will allow the network densification that we mentioned. But technically it's still going to be uh, E node B doing the processing and antennas receiving the, the signal. Also you see between uh, these blocks there are letters U, U, X2, these are the name of the interfaces. The interfaces is uh, um, the definition of the procedures uh, the of, of how you exchange data between these entities. The UU interface is the definition of the interface between the user terminal or UE. UE is the official terminology for user terminals in 4G and 5G. User equipment because it can be anything not just a phone it can be a uh, sensor it can be a car a user equipment is whatever has 4g or 5g capability <coughs> if you have a look at the epc you see uh, there are a couple of um, blocks are really important here the so-called serving gateway and the MME the uh, serving gateway is um, okay let me put it this way I said before that in 4G and in 5G you will have an end-to-end -end IP flow from the server to your terminal from your the server to your user equipment but sometimes, many times actually, the user equipment moves from one cell to another, moves even very, very quickly if you are on, on a train. The serving gateway is the anchor where your f IP flows are being anchored and um, will be fanned out to whatever location you are as you move. So the serving gateway has uh, the, uh, the task of not terminating really because it doesn't stop there but of keeping your IP flows ready wherever you are moving. And if you are moving uh, then that's the, the job of the MME. The uh, MME stands for Mobility Management Entity the MME keeps track of where you are in the network, in what uh, uh, cell you are. It's useful for paging, so whenever you need to receive data or receive calls so when you're not attached to the network, it will support the paging, so it will tell the antennas to, to wake up your, your terminal, basically. And uh, uh, Serving Gateway and MME cooperate together to uh, maintain the connection throughout the operation. There are other entities here like the HSS. HSS stands for Home Subscriber Service uh, Server. Um, all the data, all the subscriber uh, data, all your, you as a subscriber have 
uh, a contract with the operator so your all the capabilities all the services that you are entitled to have or all the um, encrypt encryption material are all kept there okay let me go over uh, on a brief overview now of the um, layers of LTE starting from the physical layer uh, going up to upper layers um, as I said before LTE and 5G as well will use OFDM OFDM in, uh, uh, in the radi radio layer what is OFDM? OFDM stands for um, orthogonal frequency division multiplexing it's a frequency division but the way it is um, it is deployed the way it is used should actually be seen as a mixture of time and frequency division so or even though OFDM specifically as a technology is a frequency division multiple axis the way in which it's used in 4G networks and 5G networks is a mix of frequency and time division um, one OFDM symbols as it's used in LTE lasts uh, for uh, uh, 66.7 microseconds that's the the symbol time and uh, it may look small but it's not really if you think about it it means you have between 10,000 to 20,000 symbols every second so where, where does all this gigabyte uh, capability gigabyte per second capability come from if you only have <coughs> uh, 10 20,000 symbols 10 20k symbols every second because as an OFDM symbol uses several small um, carriers during each time symbol every small carrier is modulated and it's normally modulated using a low order modulation the reason th the real nature of, of OFDM is allowing you to have um, long lasting symbols to avoid inter symbol interference IESI um, to avoid echoes basically uh, so uh, as you know when you when you uh, transmit data in a very mixed environment you have so-called multipath effect that is the propagation and the obstacles cause reflections of the signal and the signal is received uh, from by by the receiver uh, not just on the direct path but also through several reflections that have happened so the receiver will end up receiving several echoes and copies of the original signal if <coughs> the symbols last for a short time then the echoes will affect the next symbol and removing the interference will be much harder instead in OFDM what you have is symbols that last very long although they are spread in different frequencies so when you look at a single carrier every each of these sim single carriers will just carry a long lasting symbol that has a low order modulation and this will allow you to remove the inter symbol uh, interference much more easily every OFDM symbols carries a number of subcarriers they are spaced 15 kilohertz apart and every subcarrier is digitally modulated with a low order modulation uh, because in, in this way of course the lower the order uh, the more robust we are to, to noise and so we can also uh, afford transmission at lower powers and in general if you if you look at the math considering that in every uh, OFDM symbol you have n subcarriers and a subcarrier carries a modulation for example uh, 16 QAM modulation but 
imagine the modulation just in terms of having M symbols, uh, then the resulting number of bits for OFTM uh, symbols is N subcarriers log to M, um, the number of symbols carried by, number of bits, sorry, carried by a single subcarrier. Um, these subcarriers and these uh, symbols, as you see, allow us to move in two dimensions, in the frequency dimension and in the time dimension. And in LTE, these two dimensions are exploited by the network to provide users with chunks of frequencies in time intervals. <coughs> so you are effectively being given, uh, you as a user are effectively being given one uh, chunk of uh, frequency at a different time. So FDM assigns each user the bandwidth needed for the transmission by giving them a subset of frequencies for a short period of time. This is the uh, frame structure of LTE. Hmm? So in LTE, if you look at the time domain, what we see is we see um, repeating patterns of OFDM transmissions. These patterns are grouped in two types of structures, frames and slots. So the smallest uh, of this structure is called a slot. And the single slot that lasts for 0 0.5 milliseconds um, hosts uh, six or seven, depending on uh, the, the, the guard time, six or seven OFDM symbols. Remember that a one OFDM symbol lasts 66.7 uh, microseconds. In one slot, we have six or seven of the symbols. If you do the math, they don't add up. The reason is that what we also have between symbols is uh, guard time to make sure that the symbols don't overlap One slot lasts 0 0.5 millisecond, but usually you look at a couple of slots that are called a uh, subframe. 10 subframe make up one radio frame. Why these uh, distinction? Because there are different things happening in different time scales. So we need to have a clear understanding of how time is organized in LT transmission. And it is organized as um, frames of 10 milliseconds during which, w d during which we have uh, different uh, power control uh, being, being done in time scales of 10 milliseconds. Then we have subframes of one millisecond where we have, as we shall see, um, chunks of data specifically prepared to be transmitted in this one millisecond uh, time frame. And, and then you have all the single resources that are being allocated during, during one slot. Let's look more in detail. Now here we are looking at what goes into one slot. So in this picture on the left hand side of the slide you have on the horizontal axis the time, on the vertical axis you have the frequency. 12 subcarriers in frequency, 12 contiguous subcarriers in frequency, and uh, 7 or 6 um, OFDM symbols in time, consecutive OFDM symbols in time, make up a resource block. The resource block is the basic allocation unity that is being given to users. So whenever you as a user receive data is because the network has given you a resource block. A resource block to um, 
receive data in downlink or a resource block to transmit data in uplink. This is called a resource block or a PRB, a physical resource block. It's made of, it's within one time slot and it's made of 12 contiguous subcarriers. Of course, one uh, one chunk of the subcarriers is 180 kilohertz. I said before that we have as high as 20 megahertz per channel. Of course, we in this way we can accommodate several users at the same time by giving them at the same time different physical resource blocks on different chunks of frequencies. Okay, um, every resource block also, sorry, every resource block also has, um, you see in this picture here, you may think of it as a checkerboard, and uh, some of the, um, the squares on the checkerboard have specific functions. In particular, inside every physical resource block, uh, there are the so-called reference symbols. Reference symbols or pilots. What are they? The pilots are basically known patterns of signals that the receiver knows and the transmitter knows. So they don't carry information per se because they are used for channel equalization purposes mainly. So what you're doing is uh, every now and then receiver and uh, transmitter agree on um, a resource element that is one OFDM symbol in one subcarrier where they send a known sequence of data. So they both know it and since they both know it they can see the receiver can easily equalize the channel because what he's seeing, if what he's seeing is different from what he's expecting, he may uh, perform the equalization by writing the um, channel transfer function in such a way that the next uh, uh, resource elements will be received with the, with the right correction that you need to do to accommodate the changes in the channel. Because remember, we are looking at a highly fading uh, channel. So uh, it will change in, in time. <coughs> These reference symbols are placed, of course, in known uh, parts of the resource elements. They are usually spaced three, um, uh, three subcarriers apart, and they repeat. What you see in the reference symbol is a sequence of bits, but it's not always the same sequence of bits. There is a subset of 510 different sequences of bits that are used in the reference symbol. The purpose is uh, w when the receiver looks for the reference symbol, it knows where it can find it, and it knows that one out of these 510 sequences are being transmitted. So it checks which one. Once it found the, w the, more, the most likely sequence being transmitted, it equalizes the channel. But by detecting what sequence is being transmitted, the receiver knows what cell is talking to. So the particular sequence being sent as a reference symbol allows cell identification also. So reference symbols are used for um, quality measurements, channel estimation, and uh, identification. Yes, question? Each here, each of these uh, uh, squares? Yeah. Okay, each of the, I, I know, I am, um, I, I, it's complicated to follow this because I'm constantly moving uh, the reference. So let me step back just so that we have here, what we show here is on the horizontal axis, we have the time. And the vertical axis, we have the frequencies. So each of these square is one subcarrier carrying one OFDM symbol. Okay? One OFDM symbol 
and one subcarrier. Now, in the next picture, I have swapped. <laughs> I, I, have, I have turned, not swapped, I, I have turned uh, 90 degrees. And what we see here is in the frequency domain, you have um, subcarriers, one subcarrier here, one here, one here, one here, one here, one here. And you have symbols here, 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 or you have symbols in time. Okay? So in the specific time, for example, here, you see on one subcarrier the reference pilot. The next ones are used for data. Then you have another subcarrier with a reference um, pilot. Then you have more data and so on. Then you have in the next time slot, you have only data. In the next time slot, only data. Then only data. And then again, you have reference pilots, but they are spaced three um, uh, subcarriers apart. Okay, and they always zigzag like this. The reason why you are getting different frequencies is because you want to have uh, as wide as possible the, the choice of different frequencies. So that if one frequency is, is affected by fading at a specific time, maybe the next time you will move to a different one. Is it? Do I answer your? That's right. Uh, each of the rows are one slot. Sorry, not one symbol. One slot has seven symbols. Okay, so one each of the rows here is. I uh, know. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No, sorry. Uh, each, uh, each of the rows here is one OFTM symbols, and uh, the um, uh, the slot here is 0 0.5 milliseconds. So, the uh, the length of uh, the vertical dimension is one slot. Each row is an OFTM symbol and each column is a uh, subcarrier. Any other questions? Well, I would say maybe we can have a break now. Okay, let's, uh, let's stop here. Our, that means our data are organized on the channel. It's like a checkerboard where you have uh, two dimensions. One is time, one is frequency. And you can finally um, allocate uh, resources to users using blocks of uh, OFTM symbols and sub-frequencies. Now, now another problem comes up. That is, OK, this is how you transport bits. But what's in these bits? Now one of the problems we have with LT, but with any um, cellular technology, is not just moving data from the user to the network, from the network to the user, but also doing everything that w is needed so that these data are properly received. So for example, how does a user know which of these resources are given to him? How does the network know who this user is, when this user is connected, where this user wants to connect? <coughs> uh, so the structure you have seen before is just uh, the, the broad structure that we use to carry data, but we need to give a meaning to this data. So for this reason, not all time intervals, and not all frequencies are dedicated just to data. Some of them are dedicated to other purposes. So that's, that's why we talk about uh, channels. In LTE, but also in uh, channels exist also in the 3G and 2G, channels are 
the logical structure that we give to the data that you see in this checkerboard. <coughs> so the transmitted bits that, that you receive or, or you send fit into the frame structure according to a predefined um, subdivision, a predefined uh, allocation that tell you, okay, these frequencies are used uh, for these purposes. These other frequencies are used for this other purpose. And if you are a user and you want to know what your, your um, network is sending you, what the antenna is sending you, this user will have to listen to specific frequencies at a specific time to recover the information that it needs to find where the data that it needs will be sent. <coughs> so each channel, and when every time you hear the word channel, you really have to translate it in your mind as resource blocks that are there in some, in some uh, part of the spectrum. Each of these channels convey different information. So it could be uh, the transmission parameters, uh, the identity of, of the radio that you're talking to, or the, of the antenna, uh, or other uh, information about the channel, the quality of the channel, the feedback also that the UR, that UE sends to um, the E node B. The E node B transmits data, uh, the uh, EU tells the E node B, look, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm receiving uh, quite bad quality, so you need to uh, increase the power, for example, or choose a different frequency because this doesn't work. And all this back feeding of information is done also through these channels. <coughs> Every physical channel is mapped into a portion of the LTE subframe. Remember the subframe is a portion of, is, is a, the, the union of two slots. It lasts one millisecond. So during every milliseconds in LTE, and I told you before that there was a reason why we had this aggregation of slots into sub, some frames and, and frames. Because every subframe, you have a repetition of these channels. These channels are repeated, of especially some information that you need to know all the time are constantly being broadcast. And the subframe is the unit of time during which you have this repetition of information. <coughs> there are physical channels both in downlink and in uplink, because, of course, also the UE needs to tell something to the network, and the network needs to know where uh, the UE, so in what frequencies the UE is sending back uh, the the feedback information on the quality of the channel or the actual data. This is a list of uh, the physical downlink channels. They are split, as you see, in two groups. You can see that uh, on the left-hand side, uh, you're looking at the right. Okay, <laughs> and on the right-hand side, um, you see the group, the, the two groups, control and data. So let, let's let's quickly go through all of them. <coughs> I know it's a bit daunting because they have got this strange acronym that not even I remember all the time. But uh, it's important just to know what they are and what they mean. The one of the, the most important of this channel is the PBCH, the Physical Broadcast Channel, because it carries the master information block and the rack parameters. The master information block is like the introduction of the cell. <coughs> it allows your phone to know what cell it is under. So when, you, when you're roaming, your phone doesn't know, of course, where it is, unless it listens to what is being broadcasted. And the information, the identity of the cell, is carried by the physical broadcast channel. The first thing that your, your, um, uh, your phone will do it it will look at a specific part of the frame where it knows that LTE has the physical broadcast channel. It works for every cell in all LTE systems. All cells and all LTE systems have the physical broadcast channel in those particular resource blocks because that uh, needs to be known by everyone. Every cell then has all the other pieces of information scattered around 
but the physical broadcast channel introduces you to where these other information are. Um, one important thing that I have not mentioned here but underlined, underlies all uh, these topics is the topic of synchronization. Every terminal needs to be synchronized to every slot. So uh, they, have, they need to have a, a slot-based synchronization with the node B. That is, you need to know if we, uh, I don't know if I can go back easily here, but yes, I can. So you see the structure. Well, your terminal, the user terminal needs to know in terms of uh, time, this, this structure, the time is horizontal. In time, you need to know where a slot starts. You, you need to know not just where a symbol starts, that's kind of easy, but you need to know where the slot starts. Because if you don't know where the slot starts, you don't know where the whole structure is. So the first thing you need to do is you need to synchronize to the e B and know exactly how, where the, 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 the slot starts and where you can start looking for uh, things. And the way you do it is you are basically using these uh, uh, reference pilots. <coughs> so these reference pilots and the structure they have allow you to understand the structure of the slots. Allow, since you see that the reference pilot always appears in the first slot. And since the reference pilots are a few, um, uh, a few subcarriers apart, then every time you will find a reference pilot by just looking at a few subcarriers. You find a reference pilot, you know, okay, that's where a slot starts. So you synchronize exactly to it. After you've synchronized to the beginning of the slot, then you can go looking for the physical broadcast channel that is being broadcasted in one specific part of the spectrum. And once you know that, uh, then you know uh, where to look for everything else. The physical broadcast channel has um, this master information block that points to another part of the spectrum where you have uh, the PDCCH, that's another important channel, called the physical downlink control channel, where all the rest of the information that are specific for that uh, frame, that are specific for that cell, are located. So whereas the, must, the physical broadcast channel is always for all LTE systems in one part of the frame structure, everything else is pointed by this uh, master information block that tells you, okay, look for this other resource block or this other resource block where you find uh, what frequencies we are using, what are uh, uh, the timing that we are using. Uh, uh, there are issues like timing advance, I will not go into this, but there's also one critical aspect that is uh, you never know how far you are from the cell. And so you need to not only synchronize to the beginning of the slot, but you need to synchronize your, trans your, your replies to, to uh, the cell so that your reply arrives exactly when it is expected to and it doesn't superimpose or it doesn't uh, uh, invade other slots sent by, sent by other users that may be closer or farther than you and whose signal for this reason travels more um, a shorter time or a longer time. Uh, all these um, information are being exchanged uh, through the master information block and through the rack parameter. The rack parameters. The rack parameters are again another important issue that another important piece of information that you find in the physical uh, broadcast channel. The rack parameters tell the users the user terminals, what frequencies they can use to ask for access. So they tell, look, if you want to join me, then send a request on these frequencies. These frequencies are the frequencies that are reserved for the rack, the uh, random access channel, or the radio, radio access or random access. You, you see both uh, denominations. Uh, I'll, I'll say something about this in the uplink part later on. And then there are other uh, um, physical downlink channels for the control part that are used uh, during uh, 
um, the exchange of data. In LTE, every time you send data, you receive an acknowledgement back. Where this acknowledgement is being sent, or what frequencies or what resource blocks is being, uh, is being uh, um, shown here. The physical hybrid RQ indicator channel is uh, where the E node B sends the acknowledgement back to the UE. So the UE will send data, the E node B will send back an acknowledgement that said, I received AC or I have not received NAC, your data correctly. <coughs> and of course, there are the PDSCH. There's a physical downlink shared channel. The physical downlink shared channel is used for data and for system information block. I will say more about the system information block tomorrow mm -hmm. when we talk about uh, one implementation of uh, LTE and uh, LT radio access and again when you hear LTE don't just even though it's being uh, strongly associated to 4G LTE is 5G as well so all these channels are also in 5G systems and if you look at the standards you see all these channels exactly like this in the 5G standard as well so I was saying a physical downlink shared channel why shared because the more largely well broadly speaking you have a block uh, of uh, a number of resource blocks that you share because on in one time slot these resource blocks are given or in one subframe these resource blocks are given to one user in the next resource block they will be given to another user so that's why they are shared because everyone is using these resource blocks at different times one Frequency is not given exclusively to one user, but frequencies are allocated to different users on a subframe basis, sometimes even a slot basis. <coughs> How are these um, channels mapped? Uh, the mapping means how you associate one logical channel to a physical resource block, to, to physical resource elements even. Again, if you look, if you think about um, your uh, checkerboard, and what we're looking here in this picture is the checkerboard where we see the frequency on the vertical axis, and you see the time in uh, the horizontal axis. If you look at the subframe duration, subframe is two slots. In a subframe, what you see is the first uh, three. OFDM symbols of the subframe on all frequencies are dedicated to control channels. So here you map these channels listed here, PBCH, PDCCH, PDCCH, and so on, and they are all mapped somewhere here. What do we mean by mapped? For example, um, the PDCCH could be this one, this one, this one, this one, this one, and this one. It depends. It depends. This is managed by every single cell. And the physical broadcast channel will tell you which of these squares are occupied by the, control, the other control channels so that you know what to look for and where to look for it on the checkerboard. The remaining OFDM symbols during the um, rest of the subframe are reserved for data. So this broadly is the structure of every subframe. Three OFDM symbols for the control spread over different subcarriers. <coughs> All the rest of the OFDMs are OFDM symbols used for data spread over the subframe. In the uplink, we have <coughs> fewer channels, of course. Why? Because, well, um, the uplink is from the UE to the network. Um, the UE needs many control channels because it needs to provide to the 
uh, so the D not B, sorry, needs many uh, sub-channels and many physical channels to provide lots of information to the UE, but the UE basically just needs to tell the network who he is and ask permission to connect and tell the network what the UE wants to do. I want to make a phone call or I want to start exchanging data. Okay, that's all you need. So the physical uplink channels are fewer than the number of um, uh, downlink channels and the physical uplink channels are not fixed but they are arranged in a way as mandated by the e -Node B. The e -Node B will tell the user equipment how to structure its physical resource, its physical uh, um, uplink channels. So it will, the e -Node B will tell the user terminal, look, if you want to request admission to the network, whoever you are, because right now I don't know you yet, but if you want to uh, request admission to the network, then you need to use uh, these uh, subframes on these frequencies and uh, send there a request for admission. <coughs> this is the physical random access channel in uplink called PRAC. Um, wh what the way it works is whenever a UE wants to access the network, it will look on the radi radio access channel for information on what are the uplink frequencies used for the purpose of requesting admission. When will you reserve, when will you request admission? Now, we, here you have uh, um, the problem of resource sharing because there may be several, and there are, several user terminals requesting admission at all times. So you need to request admission in a kind of random way to avoid synchronization. If everyone were going to ask admission at a specific subframe, then they will all collide. They will all ask, may I come in, may I come in at the same time, and no one will be able to come in because all these uh, requests will collide. Instead, the way the structure is, um, there are a number of subcarriers and the number of subframes that are reserved for the physical um, random access channel. Every user equipment will pick one at random, will pick one subframe in a specific time interval and a chunk of frequencies to send its uh, request. In this way, there is still the chance of a collision, but likely sometimes, uh, many times, I will just uh, be able to transmit. And what I do is, I, when I transmit, I pick a so-called random access preamble, that is this green thing you see here. It, it is composed of 72 subcarriers that you can uh, use out of, uh, it depends on how many subcarriers are allocated by that E not B at that moment, depending on how much traffic it's expecting. So you may allocate for this purpose 200, 400 uh, subcarriers, um, but every one, every uh, request will come in a subframe chosen by the user in a range of, of frequencies chosen by the user by sending a preamble that is a known sequence of bits. There are uh, 64 different preambles why 64 different preambles? Because once you've transmitted a preamble on a subframe, if the network has been able to hear you, if the E B has been able to hear you and decode your preamble, it will say, okay, <coughs> whoever sent me this preamble in that subframe, please go to this other uh, uh, channel where we can start talking. So if you collided with someone else, your preamble would not be heard by the E B, so you will not receive this confirmation. And you will have to try again. Pick another preamble, pick another subframe, and try to send again this, this, uh, this information. 
Of course, this preamble uh, will uh, uh, be heard at some point, hopefully, and you will be able to access the network. That is, you'll be, you'll be given some dedicated resources where you receive all the instructions to start communication <coughs> with DNOT B. Uh, the other physical uplink channel is the physical uplink control channel that is mainly used to give feedback to um, the e B and to request for allocation of resources from the e B. So the e B will be sending you data and you return acknowledgments saying, okay, I've received or not received. You return channel quality indication to the, the e B, say, okay, I received correctly, I've not received correctly, and so on. You can send MIMO feedback just to tell uh, um, the sender to change the channel function used to encode the MIMO, and, and uh, everything else. Um, and these, uh, um, the, the resource block used for the physical uplink channel are located at the outer edges of the bandwidth reserved for the uplink. <coughs> so every um, user equipment will be allocated one chunk of frequencies in the outer edges of the bandwidth reserved for the uplink to send uh, the ACK, MAC, channel quality indication, uh, feedback for MIMO, and so on, and also for uh, um, requesting allocation to request uh, uh, data or to request a uh, uh, frequent start not request data, to, to request frequencies in upcoming resource blocks to send uh, your data and then there will be the uplink shared channel this is just for data the previous ones the prac and the, the um, uplink PUCCCH PUCCH physical uplink control channel are just for control and then there is the physical uplink share channel that carries user data. <coughs> the scheduling is one millisecond. What it means is the E B will tell you what frequencies you must use for the next millisecond, that is for the next subframe. This is called the TTI. The TTI is the transmission time interval uh, that is your scheduling unit. So you will receive instructions on which frequencies your um, user terminal will use and which frequencies the e B will be listening to when you send data to the e B. Uh, sometimes you can also bundle a group of uh, TTIs up to four TTIs just to reduce the amount of control that you need to reduce the overhead. Um, one important thing that is exchanged between the e B and the user equipment is the channel quality indication. Every TTI, the e B knows what was the quality of the channel like in the previous TTI. Why? Because it can adapt the modulation. So <coughs> there are a number of MCS. MCS stands for um, modulation and coding um, schemes that are predefined. They have an index. What happens is during a TTI, I send data, it doesn't look good the E not B the will, will receive a feedback from the UE that tells him, look, I did not really understand very well what you said, or I, I had trouble decoding your last transmission, the channel quality is bad, so please use a lower modulation encoding scheme. That means you may go from 64 QAM to still 64 QAM, but with a, <coughs> a more robust coding. coding. So uh, more redundancy being thrown in. Or you can change modulation altogether and go from 64 QAM to 16 QAM or even to QPSK. The lower, of course, as you know, um, in this case, uh, a lower rate modulation 
has a more favorable signal to noise, noise ratio allowance. But of course, you decrease the efficiency. Uh, here you see uh, a diagram of what the UE and the E node B are like um, in the, the downlink. So what, what happens here is uh, <coughs> we, can, we can work our, our way from the trans so-called transport blocks to the antenna. Transport blocks are chunks of data that higher layer send to the radio. This chunk of data receive uh, the CRC, that is, receive the uh, cyclic redundancy check. Uh, that is, you know, as you know, some redundancy data added <coughs> for purpose of, of uh, error control. Then, based on um, what is the rate at which, what is the MCS selected uh, at for that specific TTI, there will be the appropriate coding done to, the, to this data. After the coding, the channel coding, you will have interleaving. Interleaving means um, shuffling the bits around. So you take the original data plus CRC plus the coding, and then you, stuff, you start shuffling as if you're shuffling a def de deck of cards. But you shuffle it in a known way so that the receiver will be able to deshuffle it in the same way you did in the transmission. Why do you do that? Well, interleaving is done so that if there is interference affecting a, a small interval of time, it will affect uh, <coughs> single bits in different parts of the original packet. And you may be able to recover the, the error thanks to block coding that you have inserted that will, as you know, block coding allows you to recover, uh, depending on what coding you're using, you'll be able to recover uh, up to a finite number of consecutive bit errors. If you manage to have these bit errors spread around the packet, it's easier than having 20 or 30 bits that are um, wrong at the same time, consecutive bits that are wrong, because in this case, you may lose the entire packet. Once you've done the interleaving, also based on the MCS scheme that you have selected, you will, uh, your data will go through the modulation in baseband, and then there will be a resource mapping that is selecting the frequency resources that you were, uh, that the E node B is going to use in downlink. And finally, especially if you're using a MIMO system, uh, these frequencies will be allocated to one or, or more Antenna, antennas to be transmitted uh, in downlink. When you receive, you do the opposite, of course. Uh, you do a demapping. So if you are using a MIMO receiver, you collect all the information from the different antennas. You um, look at specific frequencies where you know the data are coming from, and uh, you bring everything in baseband. You do the demodulation, the deinterleaving, the decoding, and you check the CRC. Is there any error? If there is an error, then the uh, ARQ will inform in uplink the E node B that the last uh, um, transport block was received with an error, and so it will be retransmitted right away in the following TTI. Uh, this is the uplink block diagram. It's basically uh, the same idea, just in reverse order, so I will not go through it. I want to say a few things in, uh, about MIMO in LTE. Um, MIMO is a transmission and reception technique that is used to improve spectral efficiency by um, leveraging multipath. So whereas multipath in many systems is seen as a, a weakness, is seen as an obstacle that you need to overcome, uh, MIMO leverages multipath by being able to um, collect uh, transmissions that are spatially separated. And you can use um, antennas that are spatially separated to collect different copies of your transmitted signals. You can merge them together 
and have one copy that has a more favorable uh, SNR. Or you may even use these two antennas in a parallel fashion to receive two parallel streams. In this way, you increase the capacity of the system. <coughs> in LTE, MIMO is only used in the downlink direction. Uh, so you don't have MIMO encoding in uplink. It's only in downlink. And uh, uh, you need a pre coding matrix. What is pre coding matrix? Uh, I don't want to get too into too many details here because you would need a whole uh, lecture to talk about MIMO, but I just want to give you the feeling. Um, so when you, when you go through a MIMO transmission or to any transmission, you have basically that the received signal is a linear combination of the transmitter signal that is uh, combined with a transfer function of this channel plus some noise. So you can easily deal with the noise. The problem is dealing with the transfer function because the transfer function is tells you how the channel modifies your signal from the input. It's important in MIMO system to know, to characterize this transfer function very well. And usually this transfer function is characterized through feedback that is given by the receiver. So the receiver will tell the transmitter, look, I have received uh, your data in such a way, uh, so I, I guess the transfer function looks like this. But the point is, how can you provide a transfer function back to uh, the, um, the transmitter? Uh, you would need a mathematical characterization. And, and you would need a lot of bandwidth just for that. So what you do in LTE is you have a, uh, a set of pre-coded transfer functions that you can use. And you can just tell the UE uh, sorry, you, the UE just tells the inode B, look, I think you need to use um, transfer function number 15. Okay, so uh, the transfer function used in this case <coughs> will be one that the inode B already knows. And it's easier when the inode B receives, so the UE, or the UE receives from the inode B, it's easier to decode the channel by knowing exactly <coughs> what is the transfer function that it's likely being used, uh, it's likely being introduced by the channel at that time. And the channel is time changing, so we need to have this communicated all the time. And all the time we have feedback going um, from the inode B uh, to the um, UE saying, okay, you should use this set of transfer function. Why a matrix? It's talking about pre-coded matrix. Because uh, MIMO systems are multiple inputs and multiple outputs. So you have multiple antennas transmitters and multiple <laughs> antennas receivers. And each antenna in the input will have a different transfer function toward every antenna in the output. So you have a matrix. You end up with a matrix that every element of the matrix tells you what is the transfer function between an input transmitter and an output antenna at the reception. OK, this basically tells you what I have been. Uh, um, we still have 10 minutes to go. So uh, in the remaining 10 minutes, I want to go above uh, the physical layer. So the physical layer deals with uh, organizing data on the radio channel. There are upper layers that provide the data to the upper channel, to the physical layer and that uh, take care of different aspects of uh, data exchange. There are three physical layers, sorry, there are three upper layers above the physical layer. They are the MAC layer, the uh, RLC layer, and PDCP layer. What they are doing is, well, you know, you're all familiar with the OZ layering system. So every layer has specific tasks. And every layer is unaware of what the other layer is doing. It just receives data and headers that it has to manipulate, performing its own function. 
<coughs> so if you look at the different layers from the top going toward the physical layer, we have the PDCP that's mainly about ciphering. Um, so introducing encryption and encrypting the data. This is not code, not, not layer, not um, physical layer coding, but it's upper layer encryption. Then you have the RLC. The RLC is the radio link control and it is what uh, uh, prepares the data to be transmitted in the appropriate size chunks, depending on um, One thing you might have um, been wondering is, okay, if every TTI, I change the modulation coding scheme, then it means that every TTI, I can transmit fewer or, or more data. What the RLC is doing there is being aware of what is the MCS that is used by the physical layer and preparing the data for the next TTI so that I am sending to the physical layer the right amount of data that the physical layer will be able to transmit in the upcoming TTI based on the modulation scheme that is being used because that will change every TTI. This is called the transport block and this is the transport block that you saw before in this block. So these transport blocks are prepared by the RLC layer, the radio link control. And these transport blocks also are subject to um, ARQ, so retransmission requests through acknowledgements. And these radio blocks, this <coughs> sorry, these transport blocks uh, will be numbered in sequence by the RLC, so that <coughs> if one transport block needs to be retransmitted, the RLC will take care of it if it didn't receive the appropriate acknowledgement. The media access control, the MAC layer, is the one that instead is um, providing the delimitation of packets. So adding headers to the packets and uh, doing uh, error correction using fast uh, ARQ. You see that there, is, there are two ARQs being done here. This ARQ is done on a transport block level, so you um, retransmit whole chunks of data. Hybrid ARQ done at the MAC layer is much finer. So what the MAC layer tries to do here is to, uh, on request by the opposite end of, so if I am the uh, E not B, the E not B may request it from the UE and vice versa, the MAC layer will request an immediate retransmission of a very small part of the transport block. This needs to be done very quickly and this is hard to manage because what you're doing is you are trying to use extra resources to add more redundancy but the MAC layer, what the MAC layer is doing is it's trying to do this in the very short time allowed by the subframe. So the radio link control will ask for retransmission of whole blocks the MAC layer tries to manage quick retransmission using some spare resource blocks that I have during the subframe. During the subframe, the E node B will reserve, for example, to the UE, some spare resource blocks just in case I need a very quick retransmission of data because I know that there was maybe a uh, one or two sub blocks, uh, resource blocks that were affected by fading and need to be retransmitted. This allows us to avoid uh, retransmissions by the radio link control. So in LTE, we really have two layers of um, 
ARQs that are being done. One at the transport block um, level and one at a singular radio block level that may be retransmitted in case there was a failure. So as I said, higher layer sends packet to the physical layer in batches called transport blocks and every transport block is sent during a TTI. A TTI is usually one millisecond, so one subframe. And in each TTI, the E node B must uh, uh, look at what is the physical radio environment based on the report sent back by the UE and uh, decide what is the MCS used during the next, um, the next uh, TTI and what are the allocated radio resources that are given to the UE. How do we assign resources to um, UEs? Now this is a tricky issue because we know that, that terminals have specific needs. One terminal may need to uh, exchange data very quickly, another terminal will need to send email, another terminal will need to do a phone call, another terminal will need to browse the internet, upload uh, uh, or uh, update um, the Facebook status, whatever. So all these different needs come with different uh, requirements in terms of how, how many data I will need in the next uh, few milliseconds. How do I assign resources to all these terminals that are hungry for resources? Well, the standards doesn't say. The standards, the standard doesn't say what is the allocation of packets that is being done um, by the inode B. So the inode B may choose, uh, and this is usually implemented by the manufacturer. There are several packet scheduling techniques that are not in the standard. The easiest one is, for example, round robin. You see here Robin Hood, a very well-known uh, cartoon character who is famous for uh, taken from the rich and given to the poor. Round robin basically says, okay, I will not be concerned with who uh, needs more resources or who has got better channel. I will just, every subframe, give the same amount of resource blocks to all terminals that are connected to the unit B. But this is hardly the case because not everyone will have the same needs, not everyone will have the same channel. There is another approach called the maximum CI. So in every TTI, what I am trying to do is I look, look at this picture here. In time, every TTI, uh, I'm showing here the different radio channel quality as experienced by four different user equipment. So for example, the red line shows what the channel quality is like for user equipment number two. And as you see, there are some TTIs where this user equipment has a very good channel and other times where the channel quality is quite poor. Likewise for the other three UEs. The max CI uh, resource scheduling works in this way. Every TTI, the E node B looks at what user equipment has the better channel and only schedules transmissions for those UEs. So during TTI1, when I see that the UE1 and UE3, the blue and the green, have the better channel quality, I only schedule transmission to those um, UEs and I even give preference to the one that has the best channel quality, the blue one in this case. Then in the next uh, TTI, I may see that the green and the red have the best, while the blue has a very poor channel. I will not schedule anything for the blue. So you see here the difference between the round robin and the max CI approach. In the round robin, I have four UEs and every TTI I manage to serve equally all of them. So in the first TTI, I give some the same amount to the blue and the red, and the next to the green and uh, the white, and then the blue and the red, and the green and the white. Here, 
the allocation is apparently random, but what I'm doing is I try to match the channel quality to uh, the frequency, so, sorry, to so the, the UE uh, that is being uh, um, served at that time. Of course, I am betting on the fact that the information that I received in the previous TTI, this is a bit incorrect because what I'm doing is I am basing my scheduling on the previous TTI where I received the feedback from um, the UE. So I am betting that the channel will be like it, it wa what, what it was like in the previous TTI, which may not always be the case. So this will not always, will not always work. Okay, I think we've got, uh, this is all the time we have for today. Uh, I will start again tomorrow saying something about LT Advance and then moving on to the cellular use case. So thanks to all for being here today. I will meet you again tomorrow.